Welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Larissa Reinhardt's best-selling Southern Mysteries introduce heroines who are strong, sassy, and very funny. Generally, they have an X hanging around from some past disaster, like forbidden fruit. Perhaps not surprising then that when this award-winning author first started out, she thought she was writing romantic comedy. Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler, and today Larissa talks about why she loves humorous dialogue and redemption stories, and about the paranormal series set in Japan that she's working on any spare moment she gets. But before we hear from Larissa, just a reminder, the show notes for this binge reading episode are available on the website, thejoysofbingereading.com. That's where you'll find links to Larissa's website and books, as well as information about how to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. But now, here's Larissa. Hello there, Larissa, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm very excited to be here. And thanks for inviting me. That's lovely. Well, your books are really fun. But beginning at the beginning, was there a once upon a time moment when you decided that you wanted to write fiction? And if so, was there some sort of catalyst for it? Well, really, as far back as I can remember, I've uh, been creating stories mostly in my head. I can remember about the age of four writing lists of words that I knew. And in first grade, I was putting together little books and then selling them in second grade <laughs> to my neighbors. Wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I've always been into the book business, I guess. Um, and I won some awards for writing when I was younger. But then, um, I never thought seriously about becoming a writer as a career. I tried working for my, um, I worked for my local newspaper in high school and I really hated interviewing people and calling them up and I'm a little, uh, introverted. So that was really difficult for me. So my, um, thoughts of journalism that I'd been kind of toying with in high school disappeared with that. And, and then, um, eventually I just studied, I did take some creative writing courses in college, but mostly I just focused on my major, which was history and art history. So I didn't really take it seriously, but about seven or eight years ago, uh, my family was living in Japan and I I had been a teacher and I was no longer teaching. My daughters were young, but they were in school for the first time all day. And I'd lived in Japan before, so you know, I didn't need to take Ikebana classes or anything like that. And um I had been had this time that I never had before, and I was reading maybe three or four books a week and enjoying that, but wanting to do more and I was reading a popular series at the time and telling my husband how I would have written the fourth book differently because I wasn't satisfied with it. So he encouraged me. He said, well, why don't you get back into writing and just try? And so that's what I did. And um, during those two years in Japan, I wrote one manuscript that I will probably not do anything with. It was kind of a an experiment. And then um, the second manuscript I wrote was Portrait of a Dead Guy. And I I can't really remember, but I think I had it pretty much finished before we moved back to the U.S. And then I came back with it and showed it to a friend who was a writer. And she um, helped, encouraged me to look into um, different writing groups like Romance Writers of America and um, try to get it published. So that's what I did. Now you've now become extremely productive. You've got three different series that on the go. The one you mentioned, Portrait of a Dead Guy, was the first in the Cherry Tucker series, I think, wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. And then there was Maisie Albright, the Star Detective series, and now Finley Goodhart, Crime Capers. <laughs> Why did you particularly choose the mystery genre? Well, I think it kind of chose me. I, I, I like puzzles and I like the thriller aspect to plots. I like how it drives the characters forward. But I didn't really plan to just write mysteries. Um, originally, I, I didn't really realize Portrait of a Dead Guy was a cozy mystery when I submitted it to my publisher. Um, I thought it was more of a romance or a chiclet type book with a mystery subplot. Um, I'm not very good at, I read all kinds of genres, so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm not very good at understanding um, where certain books fall into certain genres. But um, I, I guess I've just um, continued on with, uh, with I like mysteries, so I, I've just continued on with them. But, like, Maisie Albright is definitely um, a little bit more women's fiction or chick lit than Cherry Tucker, which is more cozy. And then Finley Goodhart is a little bit more crime thriller, I guess. Um, they're, but they're all mysteries, definitely. Yeah, that's right. Maisie, there's a lot more um, fashion and um, sort of female stuff in it, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. um, it yeah. amazes me, actually, that you seem to be so up with all the trends for both fashion <laughs> and for um, slang. <laughs> you, you, if you saw how I dress, you would be really, really surprised. <laughs> I actually keep, like, Barneys.com open while I write those because I have no idea about fashion. I just look at, okay, what's trending, and, oh, that's what she would probably wear. I Yeah, I'm pretty clueless when it comes to dressing myself, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And now all of your heroines are pretty tough dudes, as we'd say in New Zealand. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what you'd call them in the States, but – they're pretty sharp ladies, and often they've got some sort of history to overcome. Um, as you describe it in the first Cherry Tucker portrait of a dead man book, is there something that draws you to these characters that have a challenge, sort of hard grafters made good? Well, um, I, I guess I just like those kind of characters, and I've always liked those kind of characters. I particularly like the tough dudes who are uh, men or women really who are trying to redeem themselves. I just, I just love those kind of stories. And, you know, all, all my main characters are amateur sleuths. And so I have to think about what would make someone want to investigate a murder because it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> so you have to be kind of tough or very stupid <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'd rather them be have some kind of grid and drive for justice and create a backstory that would give them um, those motives. <laughs> because, uh, you know, really the whole time I'm writing, I'm thinking you should really just let the police <laughs> handle this, not do it yourselves. <laughs> I would make a terrible sleuth. <laughs> so you need to give them a complicated backstory that explains why they would take these risks. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, otherwise, to me, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> and when you began Cherry Tucker, did you anticipate it was going to be a series? I think I did. I was I was thinking about this the other day, and it's kind of hard for me to remember because I really started with the characters and um, her relationships um, with her family members and her sort of ex-husband and of course her romantic interest and and those ideas were just kind of ping-ponging in my head before I had the actual plot for the story um and I and I wrote it pretty fast I think I wrote it in about three months so I don't think I was really thinking about it series wise but I did want to continue with those characters somehow so um I ended it so it could stand alone in case it didn't get picked up. Um, but um, luckily my publisher wanted it as a series, so that all worked out. <laughs> Great, yeah. 
they all have a very strong element of comedy as well. So when you were saying earlier that you maybe didn't have such a clear idea about where the genre lines, I think in a sense they are all they all are comedies as well as mysteries, and there is a romantic element in all of them as well. So you cross genres with them, and it makes them that much more rich about it. Does humour come naturally to you? Well, I'm not very good at telling a joke in person, <laughs> but um, I, I guess it does. I, I've just always enjoyed books that had a lot of humor. You know, I'm a big um, Carl Hyacin fan and um, uh, Stephanie Bond and and um, my mind's my, my mind's blinking right now. But Jennifer Cruzy, I like those stories that have a lot of um, that are focused more on dialogue instead of, um, uh, you know, I don't do well when it comes to um, stories that are really dependent on um, explaining the settings and, and everything else that's going around around them. But I, I just really love dialogue. So I guess that just kind of comes a little bit naturally to me. I always write dialogue out first and then have to fill in everything else later. Well, that's an interesting way to go about it, yeah. Mm. And I'm curious about your hashtag headings in Maisie Albright. The chapter headings have each got hashtag um, phrases, and I hadn't seen that before, actually. It might be common, but that's the first time I'd seen it. Do you use those for social media and have you found that it's helped spread the word about your books? To be honest, I don't know if it's helped um, readers find the books. I tried um, using the hashtags like on Twitter and things like that um, when they were releasing, but I don't know. I don't know if they went anywhere. Um, I actually just used them because of Maisie's age. She's, I think she's 25 and, um, you know, she comes from that hashtag generation. So it seemed natural to have that in the book. And um, actually, when I got the idea for the sh for the series, I had been flipping through TV shows and saw this uh, reality show. I don't even know if it's on anymore called Rich Kids from Beverly Hills. I think that's what it's called. And they used hashtags for everything, I think, because they were Instagramming their lives, you know, that that sort of thing. So I thought that would just be kind of a fun way to do the chapter headings. And it was kind of fitting. Yeah, it was. It worked really well. And I, I saw a wonderful review that used the hashtag adorbs. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> and that word adorbs, when I came across it, I thought, oh, my gosh, I've never seen that before. But it was obvious that it was a sort of um, a slang way of saying adore, but adorbs, so a hashtag adorbs. I thought that really is one for the <laughs> for the uh, filers. Well, maybe it is working on social media. I don't know. <laughs> 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 it, it's fun too and I, I like chapter headings so it's kind of fun to come up with them for that series yeah yeah that sh she's a very sparky lass amazing uh, is that's right <laughs> um now you mentioned about being taken up by a publisher but I, but I think now you are indie published at least with some of your work is that right or you you are I'm a hybrid author at the moment well um I guess I'm hybrid because I still have books with Henry Press. That's who uh, published my Cherry Tucker series. Um, uh -huh. But I am indie with the Maisie Albright series and the Cupid Caper. I had an agent who wanted to sell Maisie Albright, but uh, at the, I, ha I have a lot of friends who are indie writers. And I really like the idea of having that kind of creative control. So I wanted to try it, and but um, I really wanted to do it properly. So I went about setting up an imprint and, and getting it registered with the sole proprietorship. And I even created a business plan, even though I'm the only one who saw it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I really like I, – I didn't realize I was really a control freak, but I guess I am because I like – um, controlling what my covers look like and and um, what uh, prices you know to set the books at and all that sort of thing. It's been it's it's been hard and a lot of work, but it's been really fun too. 
So you will continue with that? I think so. You know, I'm kind of open to experimenting with this sort of thing. So, um, you know, I'm not going to close my doors to any publishers, but right now I'm really happy with what I'm doing. Would you ever consider publishing other people's work? I don't know. Uh, Like at this point in my life, it would be difficult because I'm having enough trouble balancing my family life with my writing life and then with the added business part of it. It's, it's kept me pretty busy, but I don't know, maybe in the future, my daughters are in high school and junior high school. So maybe as then they get a little older and, and have me driving them around less, <laughs> I, I, I might look at something like that, but right now I don't think so. Uh huh. Right. I mean, you mentioned right at the beginning about how you sold your little books when you were just a <laughs> tiny tot. It sounds like there is an entrepreneur in hiding inside of you somewhere there. So <laughs> it's perhaps not so surprising that you're finding that you wanted to do it all as a business plan. <laughs> I never thought about it that way, but I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> now, if if it's true, I've read somewhere this idea that people tend to write the same story in different forms. And if, if that was so, what do you think the story would be for you? Well, I, I, I do see that I use a certain theme in all, all the three series. And they are all about women who have been abandoned by their parents or a, one parent in some form. And that's kind of, you know, molded them into the person they they are. So, you know, with Cherry, it was her mother. And with uh, Maisie Albright, she has both parents there in the story. But, you know, her mother is kind of a stage monster. And her father, because they were divorced, hasn't been around for her during her childhood. And then uh, with Finley Goodhart, it's her mother was killed and her father is the antagonist in the story. So I'm seeing this theme when I step back and I don't know, maybe it's because I would, you know, my parents were great and they didn't abandon me. So I want to make that clear. (laughs) That's not anything I've, (laughs) I've found (laughs) in my own life, but, um, maybe because I was a teacher or, or maybe it's because what we talked about earlier about looking for motives for what would make an amateur sleuth. And that just kind of worked for me. But it just seems to be a theme that I keep bringing up in all my stories. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I I read another comment you made earlier, which sort of harks back a little bit to what you were saying at the beginning, that you you said somewhere that you never thought people like me could be a writer. And I wondered what circumstances there were that led you to feel like that, if it was simply just being a young woman and most of the writers seemed to be men or whether it was something you know, more personal? Well, I think it's more, you know, I'm from a really small town, a farming village. And the people I grew up with, my parents were teachers. And that made us a little unusual. Um, The people around us were either farmers or um, firemen, policemen, nurses, uh, factory workers. So I didn't know anybody really who was, you know, a kind of a creative person. I knew creative people, but none that got, you know, made a career out of it. So to me, it always seemed like somebody who's a writer would be from New York City or something, somebody a lot more sophisticated than from where I came from. So um, I never seriously considered writing as a career, I guess, because of that, even though um, I was surrounded by books as a child. My parents were big readers, and of course they were teachers too, and I spent most of my childhood reading. But, you know, the author part of it always seemed very far off and kind of mystical and magical. So, and I wasn't one to really investigate uh, about the lives of the writers. I only really cared about the books. So, I, I guess that's why. Oh, that that's, sounds very understandable. Moving away from the specific books, perhaps to a more general focus, 
Is there one thing you've done in your writing career more than any other that's been the secret to your success? You know, I, I, I don't know really how to answer this other than I like, I write the stories I really want to read. And I've read a lot. I'm a, I think all writers read a lot. So, and that's a little bit of a cop out. So, um, but I think just, I, I don't strategically plan out, you know, thinking about a series and what other people would want to read. I'm, I'm, I'm writing the characters that come to me that I care about and I want to hear their stories. And then I really like connecting with readers on an everyday level. So I try to make myself accessible to readers and, and I enjoy talking to them. So I think that's been um, really great for my career as a, an author. And as a person, it's been wonderful. I've met so many people and I just really enjoy that. That's gorgeous. Yes. You've been to Japan four times, I think, as you mentioned, and you <laughs> did also appear on a reality TV show about house hunting, uh, living in Nagoya. And you've said that your ultimate dream is to eventually write a YA paranormal mystery series set in Japan with mythological Japanese creatures. <laughs> How is that coming along? <laughs> oh, I wish I had more time to work on that. I kind of started it, but um, I, because of the other series, I've had to put it aside. Um, plus, I, I really love uh, young adult books, and you know, my daughters are reading those books now, and I would love to have something for them t to read. I mean, they probably could read my adult books, but I don't encourage it. Not that there's anything bad in them, but I don't know. It just feels a little weird. But um, Japan has such interesting mythological creatures, and I I just find it so fascinating. Plus, it's so popular there. You know, um, there's so many, you know, monster shows and monster hunting shows and things like that. So, you know, with all that anime and, and um, the manga comics, so um, I just need time to work on it. But uh, yeah, that's something I really want to do. Plus, I just want to have a, something, a series based in Japan, just because I have such a strong affection for the country, having lived there so many times. Yes, I, I wondered, just following up, how has Japan impacted on your work? I mean, obviously, you got your opportunity to write your first book while you were there, but has it impacted you in other ways that come through well, in your work? I, you know, thinking about it, um, when I began writing over there, part of it was I was kind of missing Georgia. I, when we're in the U.S., my family misses Japan, and when we're in Japan, we miss Georgia. You know how that goes. And I think it's a way for me to connect to Georgia while I was living there, setting my stories here in the States. So um, I think, I don't know, I think I think that was part, partly part of it, kind of a way of s stepping out and looking back at um, the setting and the people here, you know, from a distance. I think I think having that distance kind of um, helps me with my writing. Sure, I can I can appreciate that. Turning to Larissa as a reader, the series is called "The Joys of Binge Reading," and I can see from your Goodreads page you are amazingly um, conscientious about recording your reading and putting in lots of reviews for other people's books. Most impressive. Um, who are you currently reading in terms of binge reading? Is there are there any favorites at the oh, moment? Oh, okay. So for I just finished Fierce Kingdom, but that's not really a binge read, though I've been wanting to read it for a while. And that was really great. Um Who's that by? That's by Jen Phillips, and she's actually from Alabama, which I didn't realize until I read her book. So um it's it's kind of a literary thriller, I guess you would say. Um, speaking as someone who's not good at understanding genre, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Elmore Leonard. He's he's my favorite, and so and I, I reread books too. So I love his Jill Mansell. I'll read anything she writes. Meg Cabot, 
um, I think I've always been a binge reader. I'll just go through periods where I'll be like doing historic romance, like Mary Balog, Balog. I don't know how to say her name. Um, I'll just, I'll read a lot of those at once and then I'll get kind of tired. Then I'll switch to young adult. So, um, Annie Kaufman's these broken stars series. I don't think that's the name of the series. That's the first book. I love those. And I was able to recommend those to my daughter, which was nice. Julie Kagawa's, uh, young adult books are great. Like the iron King series. Um, and you know, when I was living in Japan earlier before there was things like Amazon and the internet, I could only get penguin classics there at, um, you know, that were written in English. So, while I was living in Japan, I was reading like Thomas Hardy and Jane Austen and, and people like that. So that was that was kind of an interesting thing to do, I think, in my tw- 20s, maybe early 30s, that I, I just had to focus on classic books because that's all I could get my hands on. Of course, the last time I lived there, I had my Kindle, so I was able to get anything I wanted, which was really nice. <laughs> That's good. That's lovely. That very wide um, range of tastes there. But yes, um, of course, the Hunger Games would have been one that I'm sure your girls have followed closely. I love the Hunger Games. I can still remember. It was like one of the first books I downloaded as an ebook. So I read the first book, Hunger Games. I think my cousin recommended it. And then I immediately downloaded the next two. And I was like, this is awesome that I can just get these books immediately. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that has contributed to the whole binge reading thing. It is fantastic when you discover someone, you just go and get their book immediately. You don't have to wait till the next morning and see if the exactly. library's got yeah, it. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> We're coming to the end of our time. So just circling back from the beginning to the end again, at this stage in your career, if you were doing it all again, what would you change, if anything? Um, I wish, so when I was had my contracts with um, Henry Press for the Cherry Tucker books, they kept me pretty busy. And I think I was publishing two books a year, maybe, or maybe towards the end, one book a year. I, I think about two books a year. But I was trying to write in between those books. And um, I did have a couple manuscripts finished. I wish I had indie published them to get it kind of into the indie publishing game at an earlier time, because now I feel like I'm a little late getting into it. So there was a lot of um, opportunity there that um, I wish I could have taken up. But um, I don't, I'm very happy with the way my career has gone so far. I wish I knew more about marketing. I wish I still know more about marketing. <laughs> I'm not very good at that, but, um, no, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. That's great. And what is next for Larissa, the writer? Have you got, what are you working on at the moment or new things that you might be planning? Well, I, I'm writing the next Maisie Albright mystery, um, NC 17. And, um, I think that will be out this fall. And then I'm, then, um, I'm always, you know, when I'm working on one book, I'm always thinking about the other books I want to be writing. It's a kind of an, an issue with me, but, um, I need to write the next, probably the next one after that'll be a, a new Finley good heart because that, uh, the Cupid caper, I really wrote it for my, um, readers who, who are signed up to my newsletter because, I had given them this short story with Finley Goodhart. I think two years ago, I wrote it as a Christmas gift. And now when you sign up for my newsletter, you can get it for free. But I had a lot of readers who enjoyed it and wanted another Finley Goodhart story. So um, I thought, well, I'll just squeeze one in before I start working on this next Maisie Albright. So I started writing it in January, and then it turned into a full novel. So that ended up being the Cupid Caper, and and that ended up being pretty successful. So now I need to write another one in, in that. So so this is the problem I've created for myself. <laughs> but I actually I want to do some kind of women's fiction type 
romantic comedy type uh, books. I have a trilogy in mind that I'd like to start. So, um, and of course that Japanese, um, young adult book I need to work on, but yeah, so too many books, not enough time. It's always a problem if you're a reader or a writer, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm sure you'd be great at romantic comedy. Um, you oh, know, well, you, you already are very good with the humor and your mystery. <laughs> so yeah, that would be, that would be fun. Look, where can readers find you online, uh, Larissa? You're, you're quite, you're out there, aren't you? Oh, I am. Yeah, I enjoy um, speaking with my readers. So I have a website at LarissaReinhardt.com. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram uh, regularly. I don't do a whole, I've tried Twitter and some of the other things, but um, I just, they don't work for me as well as Facebook and Instagram. So um, that's mainly where I am. And then I do have like a fan club on Facebook called the Mystery Minions. And um, I really chat a lot on there. Right this week, um, we're actually talking about what books we're reading. So that's been fun. Everybody's been adding to their um, to-be-read pile with that. And um, if anybody is interested in that uh, prequel story I was talking about, if you go to my website, um, you can sign up for my newsletter, and that's a free gift. So, and you you can always unsubscribe and just keep the the gift if you'd like. But, but um, yeah, I, I'm happy to give that story away. So it's called Pig in a Poke. Fantastic! That sounds great fun. <laughs> do you send out a newsletter? I do. It's not a regular newsletter. Like I don't send it weekly or monthly. I just kind of send it when I have news like book news and not just new releases I like book deals because you know I'm I'm a reader too so I always put together every month um my friends book deals and new releases and put that on my blog that's about the only thing I put on my blog and then I'll send that link in my newsletter with whatever other sales my books might be in and and um the events that I do, I, I'm going to be in Illinois in July. So there's a couple times people can catch up with me. I was in South Carolina earlier this month, and that was really fun. I just met with some of my readers, and we had coffee and just talked. So I really love that. So those are the kind of things I put in my newsletter. What do your readers tell you they like most about your books? <laughs> um. I, you know, I guess the characters, I guess they identify most with the characters. So, and I've got some who are real hardcore Cherry Tucker fans. Um, and then I have some that really love Maisie Albright. And then um, with the Cupid Caper, um, it's been interesting. Some um, seeing people, they really like the character of Lex, who is Finley Goodhart, my heroine, so her, her kind of ex boyfriend and ex-partner in crime so yeah still hanging like around I, though yeah. <laughs> like a husband that won't go away <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> I have those a lot of my stories too I guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah all of them there's that man who's lingering there sort of tantalizingly but the heroine's saying oh no I don't think just right now <laughs> I need her to, yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard. They're kind of dangling there like forbidden fruit or something. It's yeah. kind of fun. <laughs> That's right. Look, it's been wonderful talking, Larissa. Thank you so much for your time. I do hope that um, you get that Japanese trilogy or series written. It would, I'd love to read it. And, oh, um <laughs> And we'll look for your books in the future with a great deal of anticipation. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading.
The Joys of Binge Reading podcast is put together with fantastic technical help from Dan Cotton and Abe Raffles. Dan is an experienced sound and video engineer who's ready and available to help you with your next project. Seek him out at dcaudioservices at gmail.com. That's D for Daniel, C for Charlie, audio services at gmail.com or check our show notes. He's fast, he takes pride in getting it right and he's great to work with. Our voiceovers are done by Abe Raffles, another gem of sound and screen. Abe has 20 years of experience on both sides of the camera slash microphone. As a cameraman director and also as a voice artist and TV presenter. I think you'd agree that his voice is both light-hearted and warm. He is super easy to work with no matter what the job. You'll find him at Abe, A-B-E, at pointandshoot.co.nz. As I say, the full details in the show notes on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully see you next week. Bye.